Good evening, this is Pastor Dominic from Evander Revival Center. Welcome to this live broadcast where I'll be sharing the Word of God with you. And my prayer and my hope is that this Word will challenge you, encourage you, and inspire you to come up higher and live for Christ. Well, tonight I'm in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6, and I'll be reading from verse 1 to verse 7. That's 2 Kings chapter 6. Verse 1 to verse 7. Listen to what the Bible says. And the sons of the prophet said to Elijah, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with him. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and he threw it in there. And he made the iron float. Therefore, he said, Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. Now in 2 Kings chapter 6, we read of the great prophet of the Old Testament called Elijah. But when we first read of Elijah in the scriptures, we don't read of him being a prophet. In fact, when we are introduced to Elijah, we are introduced to a farmer, somebody that was plowing the ground. That is until Elijah, the prophet of Israel, came across his path and threw his cloak upon Elijah. Elijah received the cloak of Elijah and he realized the significance of that moment. And he realized that he was being called to follow Elijah. So here goes this farmer. He begins to follow this prophet over Israel. And the Bible says that he followed Elijah all the way until Elijah was taken up with chariots of fire into heaven. So Elijah remained faithful to Elijah up until the point where God called him up to heaven. And the Bible says he was there when Elijah went up to heaven and he asked Elijah for a double portion of his spirit. Elijah said, it's not an easy thing you ask, but when you see me go up, you will receive it. In other words, if you are faithful to follow me and if you follow me to the end and if you persist and if you keep to your commitment, you will receive that which you ask. And he did receive a double portion of Elijah's spirit. In fact, Elijah would go on doing twice as many miracles as Elijah Elijah would have a 50 year plus ministry. He would have a supernatural ministry in the Old Testament that was almost unheard of. He had many signs, miracles and wonders that occurred through his ministry. He would become a prophet to not just one nation, but four nations, Israel, Judah, Moab and Syria. And yeah, we see how God uses Elijah so powerfully. But it all started with Elijah following Elijah. And what we learn through Elijah is that if we're ever going to be effective as leaders, we've got to first be effective followers. Now, I say that because we are living in a day and age where everybody wants to grab onto the baton of leadership. And if I say everybody, most people. People want leadership. People want position. People want title. People want rewards without sacrifice. But in the kingdom of God, if you're ever going to get into a position of leadership, if you're ever going to fulfill the call of God upon your life, God will call you first to follow, to be an obedient follower, to be an effective follower, so that when you do lead, you can be an effective leader. And Elijah was an effective follower of Elijah, his predecessor. And later on, he himself became a very effective prophet, man of God, a very effective leader. But it all started with him following. 
Now, if you say you are called to ministry, if you, if you say that you are called to be a pastor, if you say you are called to be an evangelist, if you say you are called to be a prophet or to the fivefold ministry, who are you following? Who are you serving? I remember years ago I was in a, in a men's meeting and, and this was a camp. And I was really, really touched by the presence of God and the word that was being preached. And I remember the final session at that men's camp. The evangelist spoke about if we're ever going to be greatly used of God, we need to go and serve another man of God or another woman of God. And that message had such a profound impact upon my life. In fact, I believe that was God speaking directly to my heart. And I went and I started serving in my local church like never before. I served my pastor and I made sure to do what I can. To be an Elijah unto him. And I'm telling you, if I'd never did that, I don't think I would have ever been where I am today in ministry as a pastor over a church. And I say that very, very humbly because I realize that had God not opened up the doors and had God not given me the grace and had God not blessed me, I would not be where I am. So I say that with all humility. That God opened the doors, but I had to make a decision to follow. I had to make a decision to follow a man of God and to respect and honor that man of God. So that's what Elijah did. And eventually he had his own school of prophets. And we read here in 2 Kings chapter 6 how one of the sons of the prophets came to Elijah and said to Elijah, See now the place where we dwell with you is too small. It's way too small. The school is outgrowing the facility that we've got. So they came to Elijah and they said, we need a bigger place. We are busy expanding. The blessing of God is upon this ministry and and the school is busy growing and we need a bigger building. Now, I just want to say at that point, if you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a child of God, you have been called to increase. You and I have been called to increase. In fact, God created us to increase. Think about it. The very first command in all of scripture is found in Genesis chapter 1 verse uh, 28. The very first command. And what did God command? He spoke unto man and he said, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. The very first command in the Bible. God called man to increase. Why? Because man is created in the image of God. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 27. We are created in the image and the likeness of God. And God is ever increasing. God is a God of overflow. A God of abundance. And God has called you to increase. So it's not biblical for you to decrease or go backwards. You know, I believe... That backsliding begins when we've reached a certain point and now we start taking steps back. And it's not always evident at first, but we start taking steps back in the spirit and we start decreasing our influence. We start decreasing our impact. We're not as effective or we're not as uh, purposeful in our calling like we were before. We're not increasing for the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you, I want to be increasing. I want to be somebody that, you know, reflects God, reflects the abundance, the overflow of God. You know, the Bible says in the New Testament, as we behold Jesus, we will go from glory to glory. We are not supposed to be decreasing. Our best days aren't supposed to be behind us. Our best days are supposed to be in front of us. And I want to encourage you tonight, no matter what's happening in the economy, no matter what's about to take place in the elections, no matter what's happening with the currency, the rand, no matter what's happening with any currency in this world, the dollar, the pound, the euro, no matter what's happening, God has called you to increase where you are, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of the limitations that you might feel you've got. God calls us to increase. Listen to what Psalm 115 verse 14 to 15 says. Listen to this. May the Lord give you increase more and more. You 
and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. So in other words, the Bible tells us that God will give us increase and not just give us increase. He'll give us more and more increase. And not just that, he will increase us and our children. So God doesn't want to just bless you for your sake. God wants to bless you for your children's sake. Listen to what Job chapter 8 verse 7 says. Though your beginning was small, yet your latter end will increase abundantly. So you and I should be increasing. And I'm not just talking about finances. I'm talking about in being effective for Christ. We should be increasing in knowledge. We should be increasing in revelation. We should be increasing in prayer and worship. And, and we should have more joy, more peace. I want to ask you a question. If you look back at your, on your life over the last year, this time last year, compared to now, do you have more joy? Do you have more peace? Do you have more influence? Is the evidence of increase in your life? Is there evidence of growth? It's impossible to walk with God, to serve God, to be a born again Christian and not grow. First Corinthians chapter three, verse seven tells us that God brings growth with God. He causes things to grow. He's a life giving God. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus came to give life and not just life, but life in abundance. And in fact, God does not just give growth. He demands growth. Matthew chapter 3 verse 9 to 10. We need to bear fruit. We need to grow for the kingdom of God. <coughs> so I want to ask you, do, are you growing? Are you expanding? Are you increasing? Or have you just settled where you are? Have you just accepted the status quo? Have you just accepted mediocrity? I want to tell you, no matter where you are, you can come up higher. No matter how blessed you might feel or how cursed you might feel, as a child of God, God is calling you to increase. Increase. And, you know, I've seen it. Some people, some precious children of God, they cannot increase because they just can't conceive it. And God, has to, God had to really take a journey with me recently. And He had to start getting me to a place where I can see it, where I can conceive it in my mind, where I can see it in my spirit, where I've got the faith to believe that God wants me to increase. The Bible says that the ministry of Elijah increased to such an extent that the school of prophets that he had could not stay in the building that they had. And that's evident that God's blessing was upon the ministry of Elijah. And I believe God's blessing wants to God wants to rest his blessing upon your life, upon your home, upon your marriage, upon your children, upon your finances. God wants you to increase, to be blessed. So the Bible says the servant came and spoke to the man of God and asked him and said, please let us go down to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. And Elijah answered and said, go. So in other words, he gives permi permission. He says, look, go, go build this place that you want to build in, and, and go for it. And he gives his blessing. But I love what the servant did. Listen to what the servant says. Verse three, then one said, please consent to go with your servants. In other words, we don't just want your permission. We want your presence. You know, if you study the life of Elijah, a lot of, a lot of Bible scholars um, draw a symbolism between him and the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Elijah is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. He is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So when the servants are saying, we don't just want your permission, we want you to come with us. It could be in effect also saying that we want the presence of God. We want the blessing of God. We don't just want the promise, we want the presence. And I want to ask you, are we content with just getting the promises of God, hearing about God through teaching and preaching? Or do we want more than that? Do we want the presence of God? You see, that's what makes 
us as Christians different. It's the presence of God. You know, if you look at all the religions, what makes a religion like ours, Christianity, unique, different? Is it that we've got a holy book? All the other religions have got a holy book. Is it that we've got a building, a temple? All the other religions have got places of worship, a building, a temple. Is it because we pray? All other religions pray. Is it because we fast? All other religions fast. Is it because we hold church services? All other religions hold church services. So what makes us different? It's the presence of God. That's what made Israel different from other tribes and nations in the Old Testament. They had the presence of God. They had the Ark of the Covenant, which was symbolic of the power and the presence of God. We need God's presence. I need God's presence. You need God's presence. And I don't want to just have church. I want to experience God. I want to experience His presence. You know, in Exodus chapter 33, God sent, actually gave permission to Moses to go ahead without him. And I love what Moses said. Moses basically said, no, 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 no. If you don't go up with us, I don't want you. I don't want to go. Unless you go with us, I don't want to go. I want your presence. I want your presence more than your promise. Have we become content to be without God? Have we become content to live our lives without God, even though we say we are Christian? How much of God's presence are we experiencing on a daily, weekly basis? Or is it just once off at church every Sunday? Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build the house build in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build the house build in vain. So in other words, unless God is involved, unless God is partaking in what we are doing, how we are living, it's just going to be all for nothing if God's not involved. Jesus, in fact, said in John chapter 15, verse 5, he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I see so many precious children of God spinning their wheels, trying to accomplish things, trying to achieve goals, trying to get things. But they are draining themselves. Why? Because they're trying to do things in their own strength. They, they've got the promises of God, but they don't really have the presence of God. And I want the presence. I want the presence. You know, in Acts chapter 1, from verse 4 to verse 8, we read of how Jesus instructed his disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise from the Father, which would be the Holy Spirit. And when they would receive the promise from the Father, then they were to go from Jerusalem out into the world and preach the gospel. You see, the whole idea is without the empowerment of heaven, without the Holy Spirit, without the presence of God, they would not be effective for the kingdom of God. And when they received the Holy Spirit, then they were only able to be effective. And my worry, my concern is we've become content with just having normal church services. Just having normal Christian living. Normal in the eyes of the world. Not in the eyes of God. You know, our norm. As Christians should be the supernatural. We should constantly have a testimony. We should constantly be coming up higher. We should constantly have revelation. What has God done recently in your life? What has God spoken to you? What revelation do you have? Can you testify about God's presence? Do you have peace? Do you have joy? Or are you disturbed, worried, anxious, overwhelmed? You need to get into the presence of God. The Bible says... In the presence of God is fullness of joy. And I'm not here tonight to condemn you. No, no, no. I, I've got to challenge myself to get more into the presence of God. And that's why we are doing this time of prayer at the church where we are focusing on prayer. We are basically saying to God, Lord, we don't want to do church. We don't want to do life without you. That's why we're focusing on praying. That's why we are focusing on calling out to you. So the servant said, we want you to go with us. And Elijah answered and he said, I will go. But listen to what the Bible says. So he went with him. So Elijah goes with these students. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. 
But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Now, he has a student called to be a prophet, but busy working as a woodcutter. I wonder if the word in you was greater than the world around you. I wonder if the promise that you've received, the dream that you have is bigger than your circumstances. I know how that feels to have a promise, a dream on the inside and know that God has called you to something, to do something great. But the circumstances around you seem so small. There's so much limitations around you. Here is a young student in the Bible called to be a prophet, called to follow in the footsteps of Elijah. But he's a woodcutter. He's busy working. And while he's working, the Bible says there came a problem. There came a challenge while he was working and he was busy swinging the axe. The iron axe head fell into the water. It fell into the water. Now think with me. Yari is a young student in the Bible called to be a prophet. He's got this prophecy over his life. He's called to follow Elijah. He has been obedient. He's busy serving God. He's doing what's right. Yet he experienced a challenge. He experienced a problem. Let me tell you something. Just because you are faithful, just because you're good, doesn't mean you won't experience challenges or problems. Just because we are Christian does not make us immune to the circumstances, the difficulties of life. In fact, Peter tells us this in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. He says to us, do not be surprised by these fiery trials. Do not be surprised as if something strange is happening. In other words, this should be the norm. We go through challenges. We go through problems. It's an opportunity for God to reveal himself unto us, for us to see the hand of God. Yari is a young student working, doing what he can, sweating. You can imagine he must have been exhausted, swinging that axe, trying his best. And yet, even with the best intentions, there came a problem. And that encourages me. When I read that today, that encouraged me because it made me realize that I can have the best intentions, the best motives, and yet there comes problems. Yet there comes opposition. Yet people will be offended with me. People won't always like what I do and people won't always respect me and I'll experience disappointments. I can try my best and I will yet go through difficulty. And sometimes it's not because we're doing something wrong. It's just life. It's just life. But you see, this is also a picture of a Christian, a born again believer losing their axe head, their edge. I want to ask you, have you lost your edge? You know, when I first came to salvation, and I'm going to speak from my perspective. When I first came to salvation, I gave my heart to Jesus and I wanted to live for God and not just live for God. I wanted to serve God. I wanted to do whatever God called me to do. But it was a short while when I started experiencing disappointments. Politics, people started opposing me in the church. And I, I, I became offended. And then I started losing my edge. I wasn't praying like I always prayed. I wasn't reading the Bible like I should always read the Bible. I allowed the disappointment, the discouragement of life, the challenges of life to cause me to lose my edge. And yeah, we see how this, this young student prophet who was called for great and mighty things lost his edge. He lost his edge. Have you lost your edge? Have you lost that sparkle? Have you lost that sharpness? That man, you, you, were, you were passionate for God. You were zealous for God. You, you, it was nothing for you to go to church. But then things happened. And all of a sudden you became discouraged and despondent and, and people did things to you and you became offended and angry and you just lost your edge. You see, iron in that biblical time, in 2 Kings chapter 6, the commodity iron 
was a very expensive and valuable commodity. Not only that, this student had lent it from somebody else. So they lent this iron, this axe head, so that they could cut down trees, something that was valuable, something that had high value, that was expensive, and now they've lost the axe head in a river, in a muddy, dirty river, and it seems impossible that they're ever going to get that edge back, they're going to ever get that axe head back. Maybe that's where you feel you've lost your edge. And maybe it's not just spiritually. Maybe it's in your marriage. You've lost your edge. Maybe it's in your finances. You've lost your edge. You've lost your edge when it comes to relationships. You're just not enthusiastic anymore. You don't trust people anymore. You, you, you're pessimistic about everyone. Have you lost your edge? I want to ask you, do you have an expectation that good things are going to come? Do you have a hope? You know, the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The substance of things hoped for. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. The devil knows if he can take our hope, if he can remove our expectation, if we're not excited about the future, he knows we are limited in our faith. And I believe the devil comes and he tries to strip us of all our resistance, our trust in God. And then he comes and he attacks us. Then he comes to oppose us. Have you lost your edge? It's time to get your edge back. It's time to trust God like never before. It's time to pray like you've never prayed before. That's why we've got this uh, prayer journey that we are doing it's to encourage you to get that edge back, to get back in the presence of God, to spend time in God's presence, to read through the Gospels, to read the life of Jesus, to read the Bible and allow the Bible to read you. The Bible is alive. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, the, 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 the Bible says. So Yah was a prophet, a student prophet that lost his edge. You see, I believe... We can't look forward to the future if we're still holding on to the past. If we're still looking back at the mistakes we've made or the, the bad things people have done to us. Isaiah 43 verse 18 to 19 says, Do not remember the things of old. Do not look back in the past. But behold, God does a new thing. God does a new thing. And a lot of us can't see the new thing. We can't see that God has got victory for us. That God wants to bring breakthrough for us. We just can't see it because we're still clinging on to the past. We're still looking back at yesterday that we can't look forward to tomorrow with joy. So no matter what your finances look like. No matter what your health looks like. No matter what your relationships look like. Maybe you've lost your edge as a person. I want to tell you. God wants you to come up higher. And when I lost my edge, I had to do something to get my edge back. And I want to give you a three-step process, three steps to getting your edge back that we find in the scripture. And it's what I did to get my edge back. Number one, listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, verse 5, that the servant cried out to Elijah. He cried out to Elijah. The servant cried out to Elijah. Step number one, to get your edge back, you've got to start praying. You've got to start praying. And maybe you say, I do pray. I want to challenge you to go deeper into prayer, to spend more time in prayer. To start taking the word and start praying the word. You know, God constantly invites us in scripture to call out to him. Listen to what Jeremiah chapter 33 verse 3 says. This is God speaking. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Call to me. God is inviting you to call to him. How do you call to him? By praying. By praying. Psalm 145 verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth. If you call out to God. For your marriage, for your child, if you call out to God, for your finances, for your health, if you call out to God, for any difficult situation that you are going through, any crisis you are enduring, the Bible says that God will hear you. Not might hear you, God will hear you. 
That's the power of prayer. But the devil wants you to think that prayer has got no power, that your prayers aren't effective. The servant called out to the man of God. Listen to what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 says. Listen to this. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. They're on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. James chapter 1, verse 5. The Bible says if we need wisdom, we can call to God. We can ask God and he will give us wisdom. Maybe you need wisdom for something you're going through. Maybe you need breakthrough. Call to God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7. Paul encourages us to pray and he says when we pray and we start calling out to God, then the peace of God will begin to come into our lives. We'll start experiencing the peace of God. Let me tell you something. A Christian that is disturbed is a Christian that's not praying enough. Because the Bible cannot lie. And if Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 to 7 says that we are to pray, bring our supplication unto God with thanksgiving, then the peace of God will come into our hearts. The Bible cannot lie. So it's impossible to say you pray, but you're disturbed, you're worried, you're concerned, you're overwhelmed. Then you need to actually go into the presence of God and start praying. Start speaking to God. Start telling God what's going on in your heart. You know, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, we read of how the disciples had lost their edge. They were used to casting out demons, performing signs, miracles and wonders because Jesus had equipped them with the anointing to do so. But they came... A day where they could not cast out a demon out of a, a young boy. And Jesus came and he had to cast out the demon. And they went to Jesus and they said, why could we not cast out this demon? We are used to casting out demons. Why have we lost our edge? Why are we not as effective? And Jesus said, this kind comes out not except, this kind will not come out except with prayer and fasting. Matthew chapter 17 verse 21. Prayer is the key. Prayer. A life of prayer. Let me tell you something. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. That's what Ian Bounds said. Prayer is the key to power in the life of a Christian. The question I have is, do we reflect the church of the book of Acts of the New Testament? You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter 5 verse 11, that the communities feared the church. But today the church is fearing the community. But you see, when we start praying, when we start seeking God, the world is going to start respecting the church. It's going to start valuing what Christians say. It's going to start coming to the house of the Lord for wisdom and discernment. But we need to pray. Pray. You want your edge back? You want to get back that sparkle? You want to be on fire for God again? Start praying. Second step. The Bible says, listen to this, verse 6. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. The student, the student prophet showed the man of God the place. Where it fell. Number one, you want to get your edge back, pray. Number two, you're going to have to admit. You're going to have to admit that you lost it. The student prophet had to admit that he lost it. He had to show him specifically where it fell. You see, God wants you and me to be sincere and honest with him. And I, and I believe God is speaking to you tonight and he's saying, show me where you lost it. Show me where you lost your expectation. Show me where you lost your hope. Show me where disappointment overwhelmed you and you're not as faithful as what you used to be. Show me where you lost your courage. Show me where you lost your trust in God. Take me to that place. It reminds me of the story in John chapter 11 where Lazarus died and Mary and Martha had to bury Lazarus. And this is after... They were trusting that Jesus would come through for them. And when things didn't happen the way they wanted, they were very disappointed. And, and the Bible says that when Jesus eventually came to Bethany where they were staying and he met them and they were weeping and crying before him. Jesus said something to them in John chapter 11 verse 34. He said, show me the place. 
Show me the grave. Show me where you buried Lazarus. You see, Jesus is omniscient. He is God in the scriptures. So he would have known exactly where the place was. So this was not a GPS location pin request. No, it wasn't. This was Jesus saying, take me to that place where you lost it, where you lost your faith, where you stopped praying, where you were disappointed. We need to take God to the place of hurt, the place where we were cut, the place where we felt for, for uh, where, where we felt people forsook us, where we felt people rejected us. The man of God said, show me where you lost it. Show me. Take me to that place. God is not intimidated by your pain. God is not intimidated by your questions. And God is not intimidated by your disappointment. In fact, he encourages you to come to him and to speak to him with genuineness. You know, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says this. Listen to this. If we confess, admit, if we confess our sins, if, if we would just take that step, if we would confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we would just admit, if we would just open up to God. I want to ask you, are you in denial tonight? Are you in denial that you need help, that you need to repent, that you need God to fix up your life? Are you in denial that you're not increasing like you did, that you have lost your edge, but you're in denial? Are you like a prophet, a student prophet in this story, who instead of admitting they've lost their edge, that they have lost this axe head, they are just taking that plank of wood and hitting it against a tree and they've become blunt. You know how many blunt Christians we got in the church? They just don't want to admit. They just don't want to look bad. They just don't want to confess. Uh, they've got to hold it together. They've got to hold their pose. They've got to wear this facade. I want to tell you, it doesn't work with God. God cannot bless your mask and God cannot anoint your facade. You need to peel it off and you need to be genuine and real with God. And you need to say, I've missed it. I've made a mistake. Yes, I am offended. Yes, I am angry. Yes, I am disappointed. Yes, I don't pray like I should. I don't read the Bible like I should. I know. I know. And I had to go and start praying. And I had to really start confessing before God that I was angry, that I was bitter, that I was disappointed. But if I didn't do that, God could not bring cleanse into my heart. He could not cleanse my heart of all the junk, all the anger, the bitterness, the resentment. So three steps to gaining your edge. Number one, pray. Number two, admit. Admit that you've lost it. And number three, listen to this. Listen to what happens. And the Bible says that after the student showed the place to Elijah, Elijah cut off a stick and threw it into the water. And it made the iron float. Step number three, you need to get to the cross. The, the, the man of God took a stick, symbolic in this passage of scripture of the cross, and he threw it into the water. He threw it into the water. We, we need the cross in our situation. We need the cross in our lives. In fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 verse 23, you need to take up your cross. You need to take up your cross and follow me. You need to deny yourself. There came a place where I had to pray, but not just pray. I had to confess, but not just confess. I had to deny myself and take up my cross and say, you know what? It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. I want a testimony for the kingdom and for the glory of God. And I choose to decrease so that Jesus can increase. We need to get back to the cross. In Exodus chapter 15, we read of how the Israelites came out of Egypt and they came to a place and they found water, but the water was bitter. So the Bible says that Moses took a tree and he threw it into the water as God instructed him. And as he threw it into the water, the water turned from bitter to sweet. You know what you need? You need the tree of life. You need the cross. So many people have become bitter today. Jesus said in the last days, many people, the love of many will grow cold. Luke chapter 24, verse 11 to 12. Many, their love will grow cold. They will become bitter. But when the cross 
becomes a reality in your life. When you submit to the cross, when you serve Jesus, when you take up your cross, guess what? You start becoming sweet once again. You start getting a smile on your face. You start having this joy. You know, when I got back to the cross, I started being enthusiastic again. I started seeing the best in people. It was easy to trust people again. But I had to deny myself. I had to take up my cross. So number one, pray. Number two, admit. Number three, get to the cross. Get to the cross. Leave it at the cross. Leave all the, the resentment, the anger, the bitterness. Leave it there. And say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. The Bible says that the axe head floated. And while it floated, verse 7, Elijah said to the student, pick it up for yourself. Pick it up for yourself. I've come to tell you, God will do his part if you trust him, if you pray. God will do his part. But God expects you to do your part. God expects me to do my part. We cannot be passive in our faith and expect to see the miraculous. If you want God to do the supernatural, if you want to see the hand of God upon your life, you're going to have to stretch. The Bible says, listen to this, so he reached out with his hand and he took it. No doubt the man of God could have got the axe head to float up to the surface, float on the water and just fly over into the student's hands. But that's not how God works. God wants us to play our part, to stretch our faith, to keep trusting, to reach out to him. This student had to stretch for his miracle. So if you want to see your miracle manifest, you're going to have to stretch yourself. You're going to have to stretch yourself, being passive, being cold, being lukewarm. It's not going to work. You're going to have to stretch to see the miracle take place. So it's time to get back your edge. It's time to believe God like you've never believed him before so that you can see the miraculous, so that you can experience the supernatural. I want to pray for you tonight. If you, if you are listening to this word and you say, Pastor, please pray for me. I need my edge back. I want to pray specifically for you. Father God, I pray right now for every brother and sister that's listening to this word right now. I pray, Lord, Father God, for those that know that they've lost their edge and are willing, Lord, Father God, to admit they lost their edge. I pray, Lord, that you would restore their edge, that you would give them again that ability, Lord, Father God, to seek you, to cry out to you, to put their trust in you. I pray, Lord, elevate their faith. Teach them what it means to fully trust you in spite of the pain, the disappointment and the anger, in spite of what people are doing, the hurt. I pray, Lord, help each and every brother and sister that's listening to this word to regain their edge, to be sharp for Jesus. I pray, Lord, please help us. Please help us, Lord. Help me, Lord, not to be blunt as a Christian, but to be sharp for Jesus. Bless us tonight with a good night's rest and be with us in this week to come, my Lord. We don't just want your promise. We want your presence. We give you all the glory and honor. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And all of God's children said, Amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this word. I really do appreciate it. Thank you to all of you who comment, like and share. I am so grateful. I quickly want to greet everybody that's online. Louisa Fisser, it's good to see you online. God bless you, Louisa. Lizelle Bates, it's good to see you online. I trust that you are doing well, Lizelle. Marie Wilder, it's good to have you online. God bless you. Lizelle Bates says, I can't without God. Oh, well, I agree with you. I agree with you. Without God, we can't, Lizelle. Henry Bridger, it's good to have you online. He says, just keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. I agree with you, Henry. Sorrel Muton, it's good to have you online. God bless you and your precious wife, Rieta. It's good to have you online, Sorrel. Nalin Knip, it's good to have you online. Please send regards to Jimbo. God bless you, Nalin. Rita van Niekerk, it's good to have you online. God bless you, Rita. Pastor Yolanda van Vieren, it's good to have you online. God bless you, Pastor. Please send regards to Gert. Yolani Boote, it's good to have you online. God bless you, Yolani. 
I trust that you, Michael and Alex, are doing well. I trust that Bruce and Monet are doing well. God bless you all. Well, that's all that I have for this evening. Thank you so much for taking the time once again to watch. May you have a good night's rest. May you have a blessed Sunday. And may this be a blessed week to come. Remember, on Wednesday morning, I will be live teaching the Word of God at 8 o'clock. So please look out for that. That's our Bible study, midweek Bible study that we will be doing on Wednesday morning. This is Pastor Dominic signing out.